Chapter 7, The Last Hurrah Not long after Dante's announcement, you, John, Farah, gather in Farah's room to get ready for a party. I think we can all agree that the timing of his little shindig looks bad, but... Bad. It sounded bad when he said it was o over the loudspeaker. Then I found the tiny invitation under my door. Please wear your film noir vest and join me for a night of remembrance and relaxation. There's a party in his dead friend's house while there's still a murderer on the loose. Maybe he's trying to lighten the mood in a sweet but slightly tone-deaf way, making a memorial for da Nick. I... I think the timing is awfully convenient. He, if he is the killer, this is the perfect excuse to keep us all in one place instead of searching for clues. Agreed. It feels like he's trying to make it harder for us to solve this thing. The three of us have alibis for Nick's death, but Dante doesn't. So, if we go to this thing, the only people we can trust tonight are the people in this room and Dante isn't here. You're right. No matter how we feel about Dante, we need to keep him out of the loop tonight. For now, he's suspect number one. Dante Valdez, the actor. Is he really an actor, though? If he's, if he sucks, he's riding his daddy's coattails. Then this party might actually work in our favor. When people are drinking and dancing, they didn't have their guard down. Believe me. So what? You think we should show up and act like everything's fine? Hmm. All the while, we investigate Dante, learn what he's hiding, murderous or otherwise. Laura briefly vanishes into her closet. She steps out moments later in a sleek black dress and does an artful twirl. But if we're going to pull this off without getting his hackles up, we ought to dress to match our parts from Nick's little game. How do I look? Sufficiently femme fatale? Hmm... I like the, I like the look. A million bucks. She flashes you a glittering smile that makes your heart beat a little faster. That would be awful waste of a million dollars, but thank you. Luckily for me, looking effortlessly rich is a lot cheaper than being it. And you make it look easy. John steps into the room's adjoining bathroom and emerges a few minutes later in a pinstripe suit. Nick isn't, uh, in, well, he insisted on getting this made for me to fit the whole mob boss role. Might as well put it to use. Yo, my bro! I actually dig it. He actually looks very suave. You should dress up more often. John shifts his weight from one foot to another, adjusting his tie. My uniform is easier to move in. But thanks. Glad it's not a bad fit. Trust me, it's the opposite. What about you, Finn? If you're going to play our hard-boiled detective, you should look the part. Well, if we want Dante to think we're playing hardball, we all should. I did bring a film noir outfit for Nick's original game, but I haven't had a chance to wear it yet. Private Investigator. Hmm. I like it. It reminds me of the uh, holodeck woman who used to play with uh, Picard, if you remember, or if you've ever tuned in to that. You dock in a forest closet to change into your own outfit, but the clasp of your necklace gives you some trouble. I'll do it myself. Ask John. Ask Farah. John. You step out and glance at Jun. Jun, could you give me a hand with this? Sure. Let me see. Jun takes it from you, his strong hands briefly touching yours. He stands mere inches away from you, his hands gently brushing against your neck as he works. You look... overdressed, deeply sleep-derived, completely out of my depth? No. John finishes clasping your necklace when he pulls away your turn around to face him, catching a hint of a small smile on his face. You just look the part. It suits you. 
a genuine compliment from Jun Siong. Now I've, I've, I now I've impressed you. If you're done adorably flirting, we have a party to get to. The three of you follow the direction and Dante's invitation to an elaborate music lounge on the first floor. You spot Dante behind the room's bar. Dressed as a bartender, he grins and slides a drink across the counter as you all approach. Welcome, guys, dolls, and gorgeous guests to the Valdez Speakeasy, where the drinks are stiff, but the dance moves aren't. Alright. Except. He's wearing the same easy smile you've seen a dozen times, but part of you feels a chill at the sight. I don't want to believe that he could be our killer, but... Uh, but that's what makes a good mystery. It's never who you'd expect. Look at you all. I didn't think you'd actually dress up, John. When in Rome, you have to mingle with the locals. Eh, that is not at all how the saying goes, but I think we all cleaned up rather nicely. And I see Finn's gonna finally go on full detective. It suits you, if you don't mind me saying. Thanks, Dante. Not as much as that vest suits you. As if he was waiting for the permission, Dante lets his gaze trail down your tailored houndstooth blazer and skirt, his smile brightening. We're gonna have to agree to disagree on that one, Detective, but thank you. Your heart leaps, partially from the compliment, but partially from the nerves and the unanswered questions in your mind. The rest of the guests begin to arrive in their own noir outfits. Some seem curious and intrigued, but while others seem less enthusiastic. The lighting reminds me of those a favorite meditation app, soothing for the retinas. I don't know if I'd call partying in the wake of a murder soothing. Ditto. What were you thinking, Dante? Nick's body is still in the house. Dante lifts his hands in a placating gesture, addressing everyone. Look, I get it. This has been the worst weekend of my life, and I know I'm not alone in that. But we're stuck here until the pass is cleared. This party was the last thing Nick planned for all of us, so I thought we could honor him by getting into our roles and, well, enjoying it. It's... Just for one night what Nick would have wanted. It's a tough one. Hmm. It's just for one night. What else are we gonna do? Sit here with our arms folded and wait for the cops? Either way, it's gonna be more fun than with one of my signature cocktails. Fine, I still think it's awful, but I'd rather be awful while I'm drunk. I don't, can't promise to enjoy myself, but if it's for Nick, I can at least play my part for one night. I know it's hard, but you deserve to get out of your own head for a while. Maybe give it a try? Well, I'll take any relaxation I can get. Don't they get me some alcohol, stat. Sure. Do you want a margarita or, uh... Oh, no, no mixed drinks. Sugary syrups are a murder on the skin. Uh, no pun intended. And I just need shots. I'm not saying it five times. Hell yeah. Where's this crystal been hiding all this time? No idea, but I'll take my chances with the sugary syrups. Once Dante pours out some drinks, the group disperses. He beckons you, John, and Faro over to one side of the bar, lowering his voice. Listen, I know this probably isn't everyone's thing, but I hope the party would help. You know, get everyone in one place for questions. He seems sincere, but he's also a professional actor. Dante, you gotta admit this is a weird way to do it. I'm with Finn. Putting on a costume isn't exactly my go-to after a friend and boss gets murdered. I know, but if everyone's here enjoying top-shelf stuff, they might be a little more willing to talk than they were before. You mean when we interviewed them? Nobody likes sitting in the hot seat, right? But ask a few friendly questions over a drink and maybe they'll loosen up. That's a surprisingly good explanation. 
don't you show Finn around this lovely lounge, Dante, and Jen and I can start snooping on our guests. Translation, I'll start asking everyone else what they know about Dante. That means I just need to keep him busy. Sounds good. Check this out. As far as ushers John away, Dante steps out from behind the bar to join you. See these floorboards Nick found there out at this club that the Al Capone ran was being torn down, so he bought the floor. So we're standing on Al Capone's floor? Yep. I know directors who don't take as much care with their sets as Nick did with this bar, and uh, with our character bios. Wait, I didn't make you a drink yet, did I? I've been practicing the perfect thing. He slides across the bar in one effortless motion. He pulls out a strange green bottle and quickly mixes up a cocktail. Is it just a cocktail? Dun dun dun! Here, this one's called Death in the Afternoon. Oh lord. What a name. But even if he was the killer, he'd know better than to poison me in front of eight witnesses, right? I'll take a drink. You decide to take a leap of faith. Sip on the drink. It's delicious, a little sweet, but you can definitely taste the alcohol. That's good. Strong. Phew. Eh, that'd be the uh, absinthe potent stuff. Is uh, that what's in the spooky little bottle? Yeah. Didn't think I was trying to poison you, did I? Or did you? Poison you, me, no, never. Around the room, you either you see either other guests trying to lean into their party roles with limited success. Do you have to plunk the thing so loudly, Steve? Who's Steve, you stingy long shark? I'm the piano man, baby. Crystal sidles over to the piano with another shot in hand, giving Steve a sidelong glance. I like the piano man's style. That's almost as bad as John's mobster impression. John and Farah siddle back over to the bar. I never claimed it'd be good, but maybe Finn should give the detective thing a whirl. As long as one of you sticks around to order the next cocktail, if people don't see me or anyone ordering, nobody will come get a drink. This is my chance to do some more snooping with one of them, but someone's gotta keep Dante off our tail. Uh, Farah seems smart, so I'll do Jun. You subtly signal for Jun to come with you. I don't drink on the job, but Farah was saying she was dying for another drink. Of course, it's not every day I get a certified movie star to serve me drinks. Although I was really hoping for a hot toddy, would it be too much trouble for you to make some tea? I think I've actually got a kettle back here, uh, somewhere. You leave Farah to keep Dante occupied while you and John slip away. Did you two manage to get any uh, new info on Dante? Steve was no help, as usual. He thinks Dante and him are buds, even though he's the one who called out Dante as our possible killer. That guy is constitutionally incapable of being useful. Crystal's excited about Dante's big movie. Pete thinks it's having tra production troubles. It was announced a year ago, and there's still no trailer. Hmm, Dante didn't say anything about it being stuck in production hell. That's interesting. But not necessarily a red flag. Maybe things are, aren't as bad as Pete thinks, or maybe it's just baseless Hollywood gossip. We should ask around the party, see what everyone else thinks. Starting with, um, how about the good doctor? Spot M Madani at the edge of the dance floor, dressed as a beat cop. Nick apparently cast her as a sipping a drink. All right, how do you want to handle this? Glance around at everyone's costumes. As strange as it is, it is to be at a party, it is to, nice to see Nick's plans come to fruition. Mm, the way a hard-boiled detective and mobster would. You stroll up to Madani with a John in your wake and clear your throat. Hey there, officer. Are you keeping the streets quiet tonight? Oh, yes, I, I sure am. The only danger I see tonight is unlikely pairing of a detective and a mob boss. 
Don't start any trouble or I'll have you both arrested. That's a good way to find yourself swimming with the fishies. John delivers a little hesitant, but when he crosses his arms over his chest, she blinks. But I can uh, let you off with a warning? This character thing is hard. I can't believe Nick put me up to this. You're doing great. We actually just had one more question. Did you see Dante upstairs on the phone shortly before Nick was murdered? Oh, you're serious. Why are you two asking about Dante? We want to... Know what the call was about. Oh, I'm not sure why that's any of your business. You're right. It might not have been... It not, might not have had to do with Nick's death, but we can't know that without knowing what the call was about. She eyes you warily. Well, I can't help you. I didn't run into him anywhere besides the parlor that night. The two of you leave her to her drink, but you spot Angelina nearby sitting at a table alone. Maybe we should try Angelina next. She'd know if Nick and Dante had any issues, right? Angelina looks empty, as if she cried out everything inside, but as you and John approach, she straightens, trying to put on her roll. To what do I do owe oh, the pleasure of the town's most famous detective and infamous Bob boss finding me? Angelina, I'm not going to make you play games at a time like this. We just wanted to ask you some questions, if that's okay. Don't worry about it. I couldn't break character even if I wanted to. Jelena pushes her character envelope across the table and you recognize her role. The Wealthy Widow. I forgot that's the one Nick gave you. I'm so sorry. I can't say I was excited about it in the first place, but it'd be easier if it weren't so real. Whatever you need to ask, ask away. Anything I can do to help, you figure out which of these laughing hyenas actually murdered Nick. I wanted to ask. Was Nick ever frustrated with Dante? Frustrated? Probably not with him, but definitely for him. Nick hated the way he always got typecast. As much as he wanted to, uh, racism was one of the few things Nick couldn't fix with money. He tried to do it for me dozens of times. Wait. Uh, wait. Why would they hate Dante? I mean, I, I, I get Angelina, but... Huh. I mean, I guess the whole reverse thing they're playing into this book now. Okay, alright, I'll accept. I'm just... This is really weird. But thank you for the insight. I'll talk about it at the end of the video. You and John step away, scanning the room for other guests to question when Liz settles over to you. Hey, are you two asking about Dante? Oh, I bet you're going to be helpful, aren't you? I mean, <clears throat> you two sticking your noses in our bartender's business. You open your mouth to respond when John lets out a gravelly reply. Boss sticks his nose wherever he pleases. You know something I ought to know, lackey? Nice one, John. I'm not sure how helpful it is, but the afternoon before Nick was killed, Dante came to me to ask for some advice. He asked if I had any tips on asking Nick for money, how to bring it up tactfully. Mm, not a smoking gun. Wait, Dante Valdez, Prince of Hollywood, needed money? What for? Uh, he never told me. Look, I didn't say anything when you interviewed me because I don't want to know if he even got around to it. But if you guys have reason to suspect Dante and not a motive, that might be one. Liz heads over to the piano where Crystal and Steve are chatting, and for just a moment, the two of you are alone. I guess it's possible motive, but I have to hand it to Dante. This isn't a bad party. High praise from the man who once told me that alone time in silence sounded like his perfect job. Mm, hey, it isn't like I don't know how to enjoy myself. I was just trained to separate work from fun. I would love to see Fun Jun someday. And they rhyme. <laughs> I think we'd get along. He raises an eyebrow, gazing at you for a moment, and then cracks another rare smile. Are you sure you're ready for that, Detective? I think I can handle anything you throw at me, Mr. Siong, and that's not a threat, just a promise. He chuckles softly. Maybe I'll introduce you to him sometime after we've caught our killer. Well, let's get back to Farah and tell her what we found. 
While Dante is behind the bar chatting with Pete, Mara joins you and John in one of the room's alcoves. So Dante's alibi is still flimsy. He claims he was on a phone call, but Steve only heard part of it, and what he heard sounded sketchy. And he might be hiding something about his film from all of us. He definitely never mentioned asking Nick for money. So, did he ask him for money and get turned down, then kill Nick, or was he really on the phone during Nick's time of death? Well, we could check, try checking the call log on his phone. If there's a gap in his, when he was murdered, that means he was lying about his alibi. Y'all glance towards Dante, who is still mixing drinks at the bar. Normally I love an excuse for a little snatch and grab, but it'll be hard to get close with Dante parked behind that bar. Spots Steve across the room, still plunking away on an old piano. Next to the piano is an old jukebox full of lounge music. Hmm. Unless we have a distraction. If we got people dancing, Dante included, you could get right up to him in the crowd. Let's get everyone moving. Let's get dangerous. Darkwing Duck! Don't at me, leave me alone. Finn, you're an artist and a genius. I do have good ideas now and then. You slide across the empty dance floor to the vinyl record player and place a jazzy record in the machine. It's turned towards you as the jaunty music begins pumping from the jukebox and you shimmy into the center of the dance floor. Listen up, everybody. Nick might not be with us, but that doesn't mean we can't honor his memory. He'd want us to have this time of our lives. Just for tonight. Let's dance. The mood starts to shift as a few people step out on the floor. Or in John included. Bodies moving to the music. Glad someone's finally putting that jukebox to good use. Nick made him to me the piano player for a reason. It's time I wow you all with a solo. Steve downs his drink, sits on the piano bench, arches his fingers over the keys with the confidence of Mozart, and then presses down. Hear that? That was a tritone! You just learned what that word was, and trust me, you do not know how to play it. Crystal drapes herself over the piano with another drink in hand. I liked it. Maybe you could show this doctor what other sounds those hands can make. As long as the doctor likes things. Fortissimo! As Steve winks and Crystal giggles at him, looking uncharacteristically relaxed, you see Pete holding out a hand to Angelina. Come on, what do you say uh, to one dance for Nick's sake? Oh, uh. Alright, it can't hurt. We never did find out who Angelina was having an affair with. Ah. As Pete gallantly steers Angelina across the dance floor, he whispered to John, John, you don't think Pete and Angelina could be... I'd never seen Pete express interest in anything that wasn't a spreadsheet or earnings report, or a game of bowling. But they say there's a first time for every... You two, move your bodies. It's a dance party. I'm not great at dancing in crowds. Well, go wiggle your hips with Madani over there. She won't judge. Mara nudges John towards an awkwardly swaying Madani, and then she takes you by the hand and twirls you across the dance floor. Okay, detective, time for mix and pleasure and work. Tell me, who do you want to eavesdrop on as we dance closer to Dante? Hmm. All right, we've got John and Madani, Liz, Steve and Crystal, Pete and Angelina. Piqued my curiosity now. That's the worst thing that can happen. Farah gives you a wink and nearly pulls you off your feet as she twirls you towards Pete and Angelina. I hope I wasn't overstepping with the dance invite, but you look like you could use a pick-me-up. I don't think anything can lift my spirits right now. Let's try for just 5% lift as a start. You, you love swing dancing, right? Remember that launch party where we figured out we both knew the, the Charleston? Where we dance circles around Nick. That was fun. You're one of the best dancers I've ever partnered with. You're only just saying that because you dance like an awkward teenager at a prom. I like to think I'm a coordinator, te coordinator teenager at a prom. Thank you very much. 
Those two seem pretty friendly. Or maybe they just know each other. Well, thanks to Nick. I'm pretty... I'm weirdly hoping it's the former. If only because the other obvious candidate for Angelina's trust partner is Steve. Okay, now remember, you have to keep Dante distracted while I left his phone. Got any suggestions for when I get to him? Well, flirting has always worked for me. Mm, I'm not sure I've got your talents in that area. Suddenly, her heel catches on something. She starts to fall, reacting on instinct. You grab her waist to steady her. You feel the rise and fall of her chest as her arms wrap around your neck. She tilts her head, and looking up at you through long lashes. Then you can always try getting up and close and personal. See, I could have stolen anything from you right now, and you'd be none the wiser. You're good at that, but I might need another demonstration. I'd be happy to give you one. I just need to fix my shoe. She bends over to adjust her heels, allowing the slit of her dress to slide up a little further. Then she feigns, losing her balance, reaching out to steady herself by placing one palm on your stomach. Oh, hello. What is a rider doing with all these muscles? Have you been hitting the gym? A woman's got to work off all the, her deadline anxiety somehow. Her eyes lock with yours, and she straightens up with a mischief, uh, mischievous grin, letting her hand drop back to her side. See, two for two, I could do this all night long. But unfortunately, we do have a phone to acquire. Remember my advice when you get to Dante. Horace spins you, let's go, and you find yourself suddenly caught by Jun. Hi. Hi. I guess we, uh, should have had this dance. Preferably over to Dante so far I can do her thing. You nod across the surprisingly crowded dance floor towards Dante, and Jun nods. Yes, then this will be one of the rare nights I show off my limited dance moves. Jun leads you out onto the dance floor, keeping you at a respectful distance. His movements are a little stiff, but he holds you confidently. I'm glad you're getting into the party spirit. You make a decent mob boss. He lets out a brief laugh and shrugs. This game is one of the last things Nick asked me to do. I figured I should honor it. You undersold yourself as a dancer, too. I was expecting you to have two left feet, but you've got good rhythm. It's not my, might not be my style, but uh, I picked up moves from people better than me. Guess I was just a good observer. Hopefully Dante won't be nearly as observant. What do you think I should do to distract him? As you sway to the music, John's brow furrows in thought. Dante is the type of guy who goes on 20-minute tangents when you bring up something he's passionate about. Talk about something he cares about, considering all the trouble he went through for all this party. Nick's obviously on his mind. I'll sway closer. I appreciate the insight, but there is one thing on my mind. You slide your hand around his back and pull him in close, your hips meeting his. You feel him shut, suck in a sharp breath. Our dancing form? Yep, it's very important for reasons. A smile softens the corners of his mouth. Then let me help. You feel his hands play against the small of your back and pull you against the firm muscles of his chest. Better? Much. Our form is flawless. And I hate to mess with perfection, but Dante's on the floor and prime for distracting. You dance out of his arms and weave through the crowd until you're face to face with Dante. About time you step it out from behind the bar. Then let everyone uh, else have all the fun. You take his hand and glide across the floor effortlessly. Despite the warmth of the room, a brief chill runs down your spine. I'm either dancing with Nick's killer, or one of Nick's best friends who'd be devastated to know we still suspect him. Either way, you can't know why I'm really doing this. I hope you've been enjoying the uh, party tonight. It was a thoughtful gesture. People seem a little more relaxed because of it. Over his shoulder, you see Cora dancing by herself, blending in as she approaches closer to Dante. She winks at you to make your move. You feel a little, uh, tense. Is something the matter? No, nothing. Just getting in sync with your footwork. Though, can I ask you something? Anything. As long as we keep dancing. Could you dip me? It's a good distraction. 
That's what you tell yourself is your top suspect, the handsomest, okay, only actor you've ever met grins at you. I haven't done one of those since I filmed the Bodice Ripper back in 2015, but I think I still remember the moves. He rests a firm hand on the small of your back, and then he's tipping you backwards while holding you steady. You feel almost like you're floating as you gaze up into his eyes. Yeah, let's say you do. Your heart beating faster, maybe it's nerves, maybe it's just the warmth of a smile. A smile you desperately want to believe is genuine. Thanks for giving me a chance to show off. From under the corner of your eye, you see Pharaoh move with precision, swiping his phone out of the vest pocket. Mission accomplished. You turn your focus back to Dante, who seems none the wiser. He holds you there for a beat longer than he needs to before he gently lifts you back up, setting you back on your feet. Thanks for not dropping me. That I can do any time. Hey, bartender, any chance of an off-duty officer uh, can get a few more drinks over here? One for me, too. I'll slide you a few Benjamins for my latest cut if you make it snappy. Guess that's my cue to get back to my post. Good call. Gotta keep the customers happy. With that, Dante spins away and then theatrically jumps the bar to get back to work. While he's busy, time to see what's on that phone. You step out into the hallway and find Farah and Jun already waiting for you. Farah waggles Dante's phone in her hand. Jun recognized Dante's pattern lock and got her little friend here open. Let's see what you're hiding. Opening the texting app on the phone, you find a series of frantic texts. Ron, remember what we talked about, okay? If word gets out, production is dead in the water, so keep quiet. Anissa, but if we don't have a deposit in the next 24 hours, we're losing our location. Dante, where's that investment you promised? Sorry, it didn't pan out working on other leads. Sounds like Dante's dream project is out of money, but what's this guy telling him to keep quiet about it? Oh boy, you ever get one of those moments where you get an air bubble? You start choking? Yeah, no, that was me. <clears throat> Excuse me. No idea. The money could be a motive, but we still need an opportunity. We should check the call log. So here's where the real party is at. Oh no. Dante enters the hallway, holding a couple of extra drinks. Did you, um, all find some new evidence? Uh, who are we? He sees his phone in your hands, his face drops. Is that... My phone? Dante, it's not... No, 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 that makes sense. It makes total sense you think I'm the killer, don't you? Dante, no, but we have to look at all the angles. The three of us have alibis, but nobody can verify where you were. Except my call log. Yeah, and when I found out there were some things you weren't telling us about your project, needing money... Makes me look like you couldn't trust me. That makes sense. Dante takes a shaky breath and runs his hand through his hair. It's time I come clean. If you really want to know what I was doing when Nick died, let me show you. You wearily hand Dante the phone and he pulls up his call log. There, starting before and going past the time of Nick's death, is a call from... You have your own dad in your phone with his full name, Gabriel Valdez? Yeah. He's that kind of dad. So, what were you talking about that was so important it came with an ANDA? The film I've been working on, it means the world to me. But from the first day on set, one of the producers was always a bit off. He was one of those guys that likes to stick his nose in everywhere, even when he doesn't have a clue what's going on. One day, he messes up big. Knocks over some rigging, gets one of the crew members injured. But he and the other producer decide to cover it up. Tell us if we say anything, the whole project will get axed. Dante. <clears throat> uh, I mean, how could they threaten you over his mistake? The people do that shit all the time, are you serious? Why are they protecting this asshole? Is the crew member okay? 
He'll recover, but he's not having an easy time. His workman comp hasn't been coming through. I've been sending his family money, but I can only send so much at once. Dad said it could be used as evidence against the production. Ironically, with filming delayed after the accident, we lost investors, even without the word getting out. Everything ground to a halt. That night Nick was killed, I was going to ask him to fund the rest of the shoot. Dad called to remind me to keep my mouth shut. He didn't know I was going to go into Nick for money, but he knew I wasn't happy keeping quiet. Wanted to remind me what was at stake. Like what? Don't you have your own connections to back you up? Why go along with this cover-up in the first place? Because Hollywood isn't that different than it was when my dad got started. Auditioning as a Valdez gets me in a room, sure, but it just means I get typecast as Gang Leader 1 instead of Gangster 3. This movie was my first shot at a leading role. The chance to be uh, at the hero my kid self was always looking for every time I went to the movies. So, when they told me that opening my mouth would kill the project, I kept my mouth shut. I couldn't let it die. Hmm. Should have still blown the whistle. Ben's right. You can't let people like that get a, get a price on your integrity. There'll always be something else they want you to cover up. I wish it was that simple, but putting my career aside, canceling a production like this puts people out of work. There's no decision I can make that doesn't hurt somebody. I'm sorry for hiding the truth from you, but if you believe me, I still want to catch Nick's killer. I swear that's all I've ever wanted. The investigation won't work unless you're completely honest with us going forward, but now that we all know the full story, I don't think you're any less trustworthy than Farah. That might be the sweetest thing you've ever said to me, and I agree I trust him. You're in the clear, Dante, and as long as the killer's still loose, we can use all the help we can get. Then we should uh, get back to that room full of drunken suspects sooner rather than later. Or and John head back into the party, but Dante pulls you aside for a moment. Finn, thanks for giving me a chance to explain myself. I know I haven't earned a lot of trust with everyone, but uh, and with everything I've kept from you three. Maybe not, but you came clean in the end. That's what truly matters. And I've got to admit, Hearing about this dream movie of yours has made me want to see it. I'm not sure it's ever gonna escape popular production hell at this point, which is a shame. I've had all my lines memorized for months. He suddenly perks up. Would you want a sneak preview? Me doing solo line reads won't have the gravitas of the real deal, but if you're really curious... Hmm. Diamond choice. Get a sneak peek with Dante. Yes, please. Yes, please. A private line read from Hollywood's next superstar? How could I say no? Then let me find us a quieter spot. Dante leads you to a private sitting room just down the hall. The noise of the party is no longer, uh, there's only a distant murmur from here. I need a second to warm up, so have a seat. Settle on the plush couch as Dante begins bouncing on his toes and humming scales. Do re mi fa so la. Scales? Really? Is this movie a musical? Not this part. That's just my, uh, part of my vocal warm up. Look at the professional over here. Well, I'd rather hate to get bad review from a critic I hold in such high esteem. I'm esteemed now. Wow, no pressure. He flashes you a grin before pacing across the room, muttering a few more warm-up phrases to himself. You need New York. Unique New York. You need unique New York. Oh my god, what the hell? What? <clears throat> okay, let me set the scene. I'm a time traveler from the future, sent back to Gregorian or Jejorian in England. The future of my world depends on me finding love before a magical curse turns my time into a sci-fi dystopia. Well, that's certainly a choice. Trust me, I know it sounds weird. Just give me a chance to win you over. 
Yeah, yeah, you're gonna need more than a chance, dude. Dante stands in the center room right in front of your couch and strikes a confident pose. If you're ready, <clears throat> then action. His posture immediately shifts. There's something a little tortured about it. And as his gaze scours the room, you can almost see what he sees. Not a parlor in your best friend's mansion, but in a Gregorian manner. A wash with candlelight. I am now blind. Listen, I know I've been hiding things from you, but it isn't because I didn't trust you. It's because when I arrived here from my dark, distant future and laid eyes on you for the first time, I knew it was destiny. I've never believed in destiny before, being a cyborg werewolf from a dystopian future. I never wanted this. <laughs> it just keeps getting worse. He drops to one knee and holds out his hand as if beseeching some unseen figure before him. But that day in the garden, when the bull Spain burned me and you dressed my wound, I knew there was something between us. And if I told you about the cyberpunk curse of the threefold cyber witches, you'd think I was mad. I'm already thinking you're mad. Dante hangs his head with the, for a moment. Eyes shining with the unshed tears. Then he looks up, jaw tensing with all the resolve of a cyborg werewolf. But this feeling you give me. Usually I only get this feeling on a full moon, but with you... Body shifts. You can also most imagine limbs stretching, cloth peeling back to reveal soft fur and gleaming metal. What in the hell? With you, I feel like I'm becoming the Psy Wolf during a mid morning ride or afternoon tea. T this is a cursed image. <laughs> this whole scenario is a cursed image. I'm sorry, no I'm not. So I'm laying it all out. I'm just a cursed cyborg werewolf from a dark future asking if you could ever love me. Nick was gonna... Oh, I would have done this just for comedy sense. It would have made no profit whatsoever, but I, I would literally fund something like this. And scene. He drops out of character as he stands, all the tension in his posture vanishing. He's back to the Dante you know. What did you think? You really elevated the material. <laughs> Are you saying you've got notes? I mean, with you in the role, it was a blast. I just felt like dialogue could use more pass. Well, you're the writer, not me. Maybe you could take a look at the script and give me your thoughts. Assuming it's not, you know, completely dead after this weekend. I'd like that. But... I just showed you one monologue. There are a couple of other really great scenes, but they involve two characters. You want to read one with me? I, I can pull your lines up on my phone. What kind of scene did you have in mind? Well, that's up to you. There's a great action scene, but there's a, also this fun romance scene. Lots of angst. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Let's do the action scene. I still don't trust him. I'm just saying. I don't trust anyone, really, but, you know. Action scene it is. We'll start from your line right there at the top. Dante scrolls through his phone and then hands it to you. You read the slug line aloud. Exit spooky English forest midnight. Close your eyes, and when you open them, you picture yourself somewhere else. Count Psywolf, what are those dastardly things? Dante, no, the Psywolf in his human form, uh, crouches in the grim forest beside you, his eye sparkling with lycanthropic anger. A gaunt shape streaks over the forest canopy, howling in fury as it pursues you. Ah, those are Chrono Vampires of Depsilian 12. They must have tracked my Chrono tri Trail. But they killed Lady Hathberry before she could pledge her marriage to your one true love. How do we stop them? They only have one weakness. It's a 45 caliber bullet made of time wood. 
Do you have such a bullet? In my saddlebag, on my horse. Then we must race to the Chrono Main at once. Dante begins running in place. You leap into action beside him. You can almost feel skeletal tree branches tearing past you as you go. They're gaining on a Psy Wolf. Curse them for attacking on the new moon when my power is the lowest. But look, there is your horse. It's a unicorn. I mean, a chrono man. Good girl, chrono man, come to me. You both jump astride the horse in your mind's eye. The chrono vampires of Depsilian 12 are closing in. The Psy Wolf hands you the flintlock pistol from his saddlebag. They haven't evolved their weapons. <laughs> Gleaming cold cyber still. Aim true, our lives, nay, our souls depend on it. I'll fire and miss wildly, or shoot the vampire clean through the heart. But the head. But that works too. Eat time wood from the heart of Yidrasil, time sucker. You fire the gun and the bullet moves in slow motion. This is if time were briefly standing still, and then it pierces the vampire's chest. The vampire disintegrates into a thousand multicolored time particles. I got him. What did I tell you, loyal time squire? You were born to ride by my side. On that dramatic note, you set aside Dante's phone. Reality comes seeping back in. You're breathless from your near escape from the chrono vampire. Grinning from ear to ear, Dante looks just as delighted. Okay, that ruled. I see why you like this movie. Almost all the stunts are real deal, too. There's a guy in Chrono Vampire prosthetics who gets to chase me on every take. I hope I get to see this in theaters someday. It's a nice change of pace from being cast as a Latino gangster with variable country of origin. Ah, I see now. I ran a fictional island country in a video game once, but I've never been a werewolf or a Gregorian count or a time traveler. Oh, I can see why this project means something special to you. They all had their perks. Well, most of them have. But yeah, there's a reason I'm holding out hope for this one. Yep. I know what you mean. When you're working on a story that matters, you can just feel it. Exactly. I'm no bodyguard like John or doctor like Madani, but the right story at the right time really can change someone's life. And that's what I want to do. I don't care about having my name at the top of a marquee. I just want to make a movie that changes someone's life. You will. No matter what happens to Sly Wolf, you will. There's something special. You're something special, Dante. I'll... <sighs> Kiss him. You take a step towards him, testing the waters, and as you close the distance between you, he doesn't back away. Instead, as you tilt your head up, Dante leans in to meet you as you press your lips to his. Finn. He places his hand gently on your lower back, pulling you in deeper. He kisses with a whole body, and every inch of you feels encircled in his warmth. When he finally pulls away, smiling more brightly than you've ever seen, you could swear you fall a few inches back on the floor. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, is that it? I, I thought you were a writer. Hey, sometimes. Yeah, no, they, they do defy description. Some things dis defy description. Well, maybe if we give it a few more tries, you'll come up with something. If I'm being honest, I've wanted to do that since the day we met. Why didn't you? He laughs ruefully and runs a hand through his hair. Well, losing Nick changed a lot of things, how much I trust almost anybody in this place. Fair. But even before, I guess I was just afraid to get too invested. Nick always talked you up, but we'd never actually met before. So, once we did, and I started to hope there might be something there, I wasn't sure how you really felt about me, or if it was just... Or if it was just another star chaser. I remember. I... I get that. I'm guessing you've been burned before. 
you don't forget the first time you introduce a partner to your dad, and they pull out an old movie poster. Ouch, wait, the first time? How many times have there been? Let's just say more than I'd like. I'm sorry, Dante, but that's not me, I promise. The limited fame of writing moderately successful mystery novels is all the celebrity I need in my life. That's one of the things I like about you. I trust you, Finn. And I trust you, especially if it means we get to do this again. The kissing or the line reading? Ideally both. The party winds down not long after. Everyone heads towards their rooms. We might not have caught Nick's killer tonight, but at least Dante's in the clear. But as you reach your own door, you notice the corner of a note sticking out from underneath. You pick it up and read the words. It's Crystal's Revivify. Interesting. What the hell does that mean? Well, probably your product's BS. Anyway, without further ado, uh, before I get to say what I gotta say, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Head down description, plenty of links and things to support me, things to check out, and uh, whatnot. Also, there is the join in thanks feature on the channel. Aside from that, let's get to saying what I gotta say. Um, so I get it. I, I do get it. Um, Hollywood is kind of caca, I'm gonna be honest with you. It's all ups and downs and topsies and turvies and... I, I get it. I do get it. There is still a bit of issues there. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, whether it be Native Americans, whether it be Cubans, whether it be a lot of people. Um, Hollywood, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I, I think in the last couple of years, at least has opened up to the Asian culture. Um, and that's nice and all, don't get me wrong. But how many Native Americans can you name on one hand? Don't worry, I'll wait, because you'll be Googling, won't you? Don't do not do Google, don't do me like that. Seriously, Google. Google how many Cubans. Okay? There's not many, is there? So, uh, just to give you a little breadcrumb, as I typically do here, um, I am a person that is mixed. Um, I grew up in a community which was about um, split down the middle, and I'm a person that is mixed, so I'm part Cuban slash Native American, so that's one of the reasons why I brought that up. And then I have a little bit of other things inside of me, but those are two of the main things that kind of stick out. And so, um, yeah, no, I, I loved going to school because you had, um, well, I'm just going to be frank with this, you had white kids and black kids that would literally take turns, and they loved, you know, right? So if you went on one side of, of the aisle, uh, you dealt with one kind of people, and then when you went to the other side of the aisle, you, you dealt with the other kind. And so I was the oddball out. My name, literally and figuratively, especially for the last name, was very unique. It still is. You probably don't hear it very often, but um, long story short is I dealt with that. And so, um, you know, it's something that I haven't let a lot of people know about, um, uh, you know, I'll talk here and there on some of my streams, but um, it's something that I never wanted to let anyone else experience in my life um, and never wanted to come off as someone who was like that. I've tried very, very hard to be an open-minded individual and someone who accepts everybody regardless of um, you know, whether it be their, their skin color, their gender, whatever, I've always been open to you as long as you're a, as a caring and kind hearted and kind soul and intelligent person. Um, I'm, I'm willing to accept you, um, again, <laughs> provided you're a good person. Um, if you're a caca person, I'm uh, disliking you, not based on anything. I'm disliking you because you're caca. That's pretty much it. Um, I pretty much have a very simple list for what passes for me, and then I'm willing to let anyone, you know, and everyone be in my in my purview and, and be in my circle. Um, you know, depending on what I feel for you and what type of person you are, is whether you're in the, you know, inner circle, friends, best friends, or perhaps a relationship. But aside from that, um, no, I keep everyone at a distance because of what I've went through. But at the same time, I do not and will not ever be the type of person that hurts people. Um, <clears throat> so if you haven't been on this channel very long, we had gone through a few, uh, things, it was, phew, many years ago, but where people actually, uh, said I was a certain type of person, and they literally and figuratively had no proof, they still have no proof to this day, no voice recordings, no screenshots, no pictures, nada, you don't have a single word that I've ever said that is against, um, you know, social media or anyone right now watching this content. So with that being said, and the meowing of my cat, 
Um, I'll just cut this short. You never will. But I always will be open to criticism and suggestions and things like that. And I always want people to hold me accountable if there ever does, which it won't, if there ever does come a time where I've said something that crosses a line. That has always been the type of person I am. Um, but I do not accept... Um, basically, it, you know, I'm, I'm going to be frank with you. If, if you have a problem against somebody, hey, keep it in your in your own mind. Keep it in between your friends or something, right? Like, I'm not going to be a person who completely polices you to the point of, like, don't you have those feelings? I know the humanity is a thing. I know it, right? We can't get rid of all the, the negativity and the negative thoughts and whatnot. But as long as you aren't going around literally and figuratively hurting people, it's no one's place to police your thoughts, right? That's how open I am. And that's how open of a person I will continue to be. You know, I, I just don't care. I really don't. Uh, I've gone through so much that it pales in comparison to a lot of other people's stories and woes as me. And yeah, there, there are people who I'm sure have, have worse things. That's why I just don't care. Like, I've, I've fine-tuned myself to be like, I just don't care who, what, when, where, why, like, who you are. I accept you regardless. I've taken pride in that. <laughs> like to a fault and to a pain. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> but with that being said, thank you all for watching. Catch you all later. And uh, let me know your comments or thoughts down below. Peace out.